Heyo everybody, Haku here with my read through for Mao Shoujo Weeks aka Kaku, a magical girl raising project. Uh, limited chapter 10 part 1. So yeah, after this we only had two chapters left. And then we get to do an update of my favorite characters video. And then we go straight into the next arc which is Aces? I don't know if it's Aces, Jokers, or Queens. But I know that's like three of the next arcs. And then there's like episode Sigma in there somewhere. But... I'm excited for that, like, a bunch of you have been talking in Discord and stuff, and a lot of people have said their favorite is, like, I don't remember which one it is, Aces, Jokers, or Queens, but there are, like, one or two of those that a lot of people have said they really like. Uh, and then it seems, too, that, like, everybody, a common favorite, is, like, so many people have said Restart is their favorite, and Restart is my favorite for sure. Um, I think for me, it's like, while all the arcs have been good, Restart not only understood the magical girl thing and understood the survival game thing, but they had mystery and they had a lot of character drama. And one thing they did that's been better than any of the other arcs is that they really made us care about the characters as humans. Like we saw a lot of Pechka and um, Shadow Gale and Fla, Detic Bell and Blue Comet slash Lapis Lazuline. Uh, we saw a ton of them in their real human forms, and even the ones we didn't. We developed a lot, not just to their characters, but their motivations, why they wanted to win and stay alive. And because we knew their motivations and we saw them in their human forms and saw them so much as human, that when they were in trouble as magical girls, it made you really worried for them. Uh, so it did even better than Unmarked at that. And where we've had some of that, here with like Kurukuru Hime, Funny Trip, we've had a little bit of that here in um, here in Limited. Not a ton though. I don't know, like a lot of the characters, I don't have a deep understanding of their motivations and why they want to stay alive. We know which characters like which, but we don't have this deep understanding of their motivations so that we can really, really root for them emotionally. Uh, or who they are as people outside of this. Um, like, like say, Malpom. I really like Malpom. When I do that favorite character video, she's probably going to be decently high up there. But at the same time, I don't know shit about her as a person. And I might learn more in later arcs or in episode Sigma. Um, but at the same time, I at least right now, I just know next to nothing about her or her motivations like I know that she was part of the good guy team and her motivation was catch the assassin but we don't know why she wanted to catch the assassin why she took the job she did anything like that uh, we got like a little bit of her personality but that isn't that deep so um, we have three chapters left and I'm really enjoying the arc I think one thing this arc has done well since I just kinda shit talked about why restart is better I want to say one thing that was good about this is we waited forever to get into the character deaths and stuff, which gave us more time to understand them and their allegiances. Again, I think things could have been better with developing them as characters and as people to make us root for them more, but at the same time, um, I think it was good to give it kind of time to breathe. But maybe again that could have back that could have backfired because a lot of this hasn't been as exciting, um, or as just like one crazy twist or something after another as the past two arcs have been. So it's just something different. I think there are enough differences where the first one was like a straight up survival game, uh, then Restart had some elements of mystery and kind of video game world type stuff in there, and then this one has more of the trying to capture a criminal and faction versus faction drama. So depending on what you prefer, prefer, I think there's enough difference between each arc that different people can appreciate different things in them. So uh, either way, getting this discussion out of the way, let's actually start reading chapter 10. It's called Walking on Rainbows. And oh yeah, now we have like five characters dead. And I think that, I think it's five dead, 11 left alive. And, of course, we know it was kind of obvious from the beginning that Rainbow was the assassin. I was kind of hoping that was kind of like a twist, sort of like in Restart, where you think one person's the assassin, but they're not. Uh, but, yeah, it was totally just Rainbow from the beginning. Uh, so, 
Yeah, I guess either way, we got Chapter 10 Walking on Rainbows. Let's start with Toko with 10 hours, 13 minutes remaining. Oh yeah, and we still have 10 hours left for uh, these last three chapters. Um, Toko remaining time, 10 hours, 13 minutes. With Malpom dead, there were no other magical girls who could win against Rainpo. She could handle the middle schoolers even if they grouped up. Not like they could even group up in the first place. Oh! This reminds me of something. I was thinking about how they could actually beat Rainpo, and then I remembered, didn't Wedden make a deal with, like, all of them that she was the leader? And since her power is that they can't go back on promises, can't she just be like, as your leader, I say quit this nonsense, and then Rainpo is screwed? Um, so Wedden might be the undoing of Rainpo, but either way. Um, not like they could even group up in the first place. After thinking that, she corrected herself in wondering, could they though? <laughs> Malpom wasn't an enemy that Rainbow couldn't deal with. Malpom and some other mysterious magical girls got into a fight. Rainpo dealt with Pom. As a result, Malpom was killed by Rainpo. She finally repaid her grudge for being slapped all the time. Uh, dealing her didn't mean dis dealing with her, I guess. Dealing with her didn't mean disposing her with force. Innocent middle schoolers were victims, ignorant amateur magical girls. That impression is what Rainpo used to fool Malpom. A veteran of many ma er, a veteran of many battles, even the great Malpom, who had abundant magical girl knowledge, was fooled. That was the kind of magical girl that Toko raised, betraying, cheating, and trusting no one. Um, trusting of no one. Toko trusted Rainpo, but Toko didn't know if Rainpo trusted Toko. The magical girl in front of them, Pithy Frederica. That rogue should have been imprisoned, but she was here for some reason. Rainpo will kill her too. Alright, kill her off, Rainpo. Okay then. Toko dived back into Rainbow's chest. Uh the place was the warmest place she could be or she could be in. Rainpo stretched a rainbow towards Frederica. Regardless of Rainpo's rainbow size, it had constant intensity. It could withstand a magical girl running on top of it, and also had the sharpness of a razor. She was able to put out more than one or two at a time. Frederica dove underneath the first rainbow. She dodged the second rainbow by sidestepping. Frederica headed forward, keeping both her hands free. Frederica continued to avoid the rainbows, the fourth and fifth rainbow that came out from the sh er, that came out from the shades aimed for Frederica's eyebrows, and just as it was on the verge, its trajectory changed when a shuriken blew it away. And, oh, so it can be redirected then. Blew it away, and stopped grazing Frederica's forehead. Huh? A shuriken? Who was that? It wasn't Frederica. There was a ninja. Her left eye was crushed, her left arm was gone, and the ninja's red muffler was fluttering as she stood on top of the guardrail. What a joke, thought Toko as she looked at the side of her. Okay, so now we're finally getting Ripple. Um, but I was going to say, too, that I did not think at all that Malpom was going to die this arc. So Malpom dying kind of opens the door that now I don't really think that any character is safe. Um, like, not even Ripple or Nanako-san, who seem kind of safe. I don't even think they're safe at this point. Um, anybody could die. Uh, but now we have Ripple with remaining time, 10 hours, 12 minutes. And oh yeah, for this, I think I'm going to read to page at least 14, but I think there's a page break on page 18 that I want to get to. Um, so yeah, either way, Ripple, 10 hours, 12 minutes. When she threw her shuriken, she instantly regretted it. She had rescued someone who she'd prefer not to notice. She was someone that she, that would be better, no, better off not living in this world, thought Ripple. No matter who you are, you didn't deserve to die, and she... Er, and even, and she even thought that sinful people should be imprisoned instead of killed. But would that person be denied e even that if they broke out of prison and killed people? By saving one person, the person she saved would cause ten or twenty people to die, which she wouldn't be able to save. She was thinking of offering aid to Malpom, but she hasn't seen Malpom anywhere. There was a machine-like uh, beautiful hole that was drilled in the center of the street. And on her surroundings, she saw Pithy Frederica, a girl lying down in a pool of blood, and a cowering and trembling postman magical girl, and a magical girl carrying rainbows on her back with a small fairy. She also saw a wrecked mini car and a foreign car running over the, the beam of the road. She recognized the mini car. It was the one they used earlier to confuse their enemies. Frederica and the rainbow magical girl were fighting against each other. 
whose side was the dead person on. She couldn't see the bottom of the deep hole. If Ma Palm were here, would she be down there? She'd met up with the rainbow-producing magical girl last night. However, her atmosphere seemed different from that time. She had a smile that looked like the fairy, or she had a smile that looked like the fairy in her chest. It had an awfulness and disgustingness inside that cute look. The look she gave Ripple wasn't the look of a person who'd run away. It was the look of a person who'll catch an eater. With the image of the ten-gallon hat gunman magical girl floating in her mind, she changed her evaluation of the rainbow magical girl from I think she's hostile to she's clearly an enemy. Ripple threw a kunai to deflect a rainbow headed her way. This was different than how she used the rainbows yesterday. Instead of a means of movement, she was using it as, it as a means of attack. It was possible to support your feet on top of it, but now she used that hardness as a weapon to attack. Ripple read it and dodged. The space between her opponent and herself, she sub er, wait. In the space between her opponent and herself, she submerged her heart deeper by one stage. Her concentration increased. She could hear the er, she could hear the small sounds of sirens getting closer. She'd rescued Frederica, but all those thoughts had disappeared. She focused her five senses on battle. Right now, that was all she could do. And now we jump to Rainbow's point of view with 10 hours and 11 minutes. Kaori Ninatsugi was good at concealing her true heart. If she didn't conceal it, she wouldn't live to be 13 years old. Kaori lived together with her sister, who was two years older than her. Her sister told her that her parents had died in an accident, but Kaori didn't know if that was the truth or not. She didn't even know if she and her sister were blood relatives at all. Her so-called sister was also recognized by her surrounding neighbors to be the eldest daughter of the Ninatsugi family. Yet Kaori didn't feel she was her sister. Because her parents died in an accident, it was inevitable that her sister would drop out of college, taking er, taking charge of her. Taking, taking charge of her sister Kaori, who was only two years younger than her. She became a hard-working person who pulled her weight and was an all-around great person, or so she was known. Kaori didn't think of whether that was the truth or not. Wouldn't a dropout student have a specific living attitude and a shortage of credits? Was her parents dying also part of her plot? Did she only take in Kaori because she wanted a toy that she could do whatever she wanted to? Kaori didn't think <clears throat> Sorry, Kaori didn't think about those things. On the outside, her sister was a good person, but inside the house she was a tyrant. If there was something she didn't like, she'd hit Kaori. If something happened at work, she'd hit Kaori. And especially if nothing happened at all, she'd hit Kaori. On the outside, she was a good person, because nothing she did ever leaked out. She didn't leave any traces, she stabbed her with sewing needles that didn't leave any wounds, made her take cold baths midwinter, pulled her hair, pushed her to a cushion, not letting her go despite being close to suffocating, muttering to her in a small voice, stretched her tongue out with pliers, denied her food, beating her without any trace. Each week she did this twice or three times and would repeat it many times every day. What is this? Um, magical girl sight? Sips water. Um, everything depended on her sister's mood. She had to make her sister feel better. If something bothered her sister, it all come back to her. She couldn't fall back on her studies. She couldn't have any bullies. She had to live school life without any excess. Nevertheless, it can't be too good. Her sister had a strong sense of jealousy. She didn't like it when Kaori was being evaluated. When Kaori got a special prize for an art competition, she stole her trophy, its condition having been trampled and punched on, and she was ordered not to win any more cer certificates. The only things she were allowed to win were perfect teeth and perfect attendance only, and other than that, she'd usually be safe if she won third or fifth place, but since it was all dependent on her sister's mood, even that wasn't a guarantee. Kaori was threatened by getting prizes, so she thought it was better if she didn't earn any. Kaori hid her true self so that no one could know what she was like. Rather than enduring the hardship of running away from her sister's strong sense of suspicion and cold observing gaze, Kaori acquired the skill of hiding her true self in order to survive. Enduring her sister was in a ensuring her sister was in a good mood without being too straightforward, being unnoticeable at school. In other words, making sure her status was not one of being bullied and wasn't an exaggeration to call your position in school as your and it wasn't an exaggeration to call your position in school as your status. She put a lot of effort as it was something to be won, or at least some or at least similar to that. 
Her faults are few, but so are her virtues. She was careful not to look like a fence-setter or an opportunist and followed the majority. She greeted her neighbors by lowering her tone just a little bit. Her sister had wanted their appearance to be that of a capable older sister and an incapable younger sister. Cowdery's efforts continued until her second semester as an elementary school fifth grader and ended there. You possess magical potential, so I'm going to make you into a magical girl. The fairy Toko had turned Cowdy into the magical girl Rain Poe. Soon after, her sister had accidentally fallen from the stairs, twisting her ankle, getting a three-day break from work. Since then, Cowdy's never been hit again. She couldn't even talk to Cowdy at home. Every time she looked at Cowdy, it was always mixed with fright, and whenever she saw her sister's frightened eyes, Cowdy was wrapped in joy. Cowdy had been freed. She could buy her favorite clothes, buy game consoles, she could buy accessories that didn't use fake jewelry, and when she entered middle school, no one ever blamed her again. Toko had turned Cowdy into Toko's ideal magical girl. Cunning, dirty, sneaky, cowardly, and highly calculative, that's the kind of magical girl I want. So, I like how kind of every arc has been about someone trying to create their ideal magical girl or push their idea of ideal magical girls. Uh, from Clamberry to Pithy to Keek, um, and now to Toko. What? You think those words are praise? Sounds more like you're dissing me instead, doesn't it? Trying to pick a fight? I am praising you. This is me respecting you. Cunning, dirty, sneaky, and cowardly, and highly calculative. All of those things fit Toko perfectly, right? Thought Rainpo. Toko was two-faced. In fact, she could use three or four-faced, too. She made the appropriate reports to the Land of Magic, only talking about the good things about the magical girl she had scouted. She lived only to pursue her own gains. Naturally, her reputation was bad. After doing Toko's job several times, she realized something. Laughing, small talk, all these things came naturally to her. Would this be what they called fun? No matter what Toko was dealing with, she always lied. The only exception was Cowdy. Or the only exception was Cowdy, Rainpo. She showed all of her fraudster and cowardly natures to Rainpo. Toko enjoyed this, and Cowdy enjoyed it as well. It wasn't fun deceiving people until now. Having someone who enjoyed these things with her was what made the whole thing fun. Toko's ideal magical girl was someone who was like Toko. That's probably why Toko wanted someone like that. Rainpo was strengthened by Toko until she became powerful. Whether it was trickery or battle, she continuously trained and refined her heart, and cultivated her competitive instinct. Malpom had taken care of the magical girl that did a head-on attack. Rainpo had killed Malpom. The musical note magical girl outside the hole has also been killed. She'll chase Frederica down soon enough. It was a mistake to let the swordsman escape, but even if she used swords, she wasn't a difficult opponent. Even if she swung her sword from a distance, Rainpo could easily handle that with her rainbows. Um... All that remains were her allies, injured people, and enemies that would ca and enemies that wouldn't cause her any trouble. First, she had to kill the ninja, the one magical girl that cooperated with the investigation team Ripple. Rainbow extended five rainbows directly toward the ninja, and three from the opposite direction, and repeated with four from the top. And now we have w finally we have Wedden with ten hours and nine minutes. She ran from alley to alley. She had to escape. What was in that hole? Why did Pookin release her magic? While not understanding anything, she continued to run. Her mind, which had been clouded all this time, is finally cleared up. It was abrupt when her mind became clouded, and it was even more abrupt when it cleared up. Whether violence was occurring or whether it stopped, she had no authority at all. Even when she was in a disoriented state, there were some memories that remained. Serving Pookin, worshipping her, not doubting her, feeling honored to be nearby and being proud of it. She released her magic, and Wedden could no longer speak English. Yet, what she seen and heard, she remembered it all in Japanese. Those were painful memories. She didn't stop them when they killed people, and when Pukin stabbed someone in the chest with her sword, she thought, my, what a strong master. Or, my, what a strong master I had, as she was trembling with joy. She felt sick. If she weren't a magical girl, she'd probably vomit all over the place. Wedem was a highly calculative, selfish egoist. As long as she got what she wanted in the end, it would be good. All of her actions were based on those lines of thinking. Even becoming a heroic magical girl was all part of her own self-interest to use magic without telling anyone. She thought that there'd be no problems. Her reason for obeying the law, because the law had the power to enforce itself as well. 
Um, if there, okay, if there were no overwhelmingly powerful people who could punish her, and if she herself was an overwhelmingly powerful powerful person outside the law, she could live her life more comfortably. If she thought about what she had become now, she realized she was only acting tough. She joined with those who trampled the weak, and for the first time she was able to realize her own ethics. Despite being a middle schooler who stood on the sidelines, she surprisingly had the heart of a hero. She didn't want to go through those things a second time. When she had been released from her magic, the first thing she had to protect was herself, so, immediate, er, so she immediately escaped through the back alleys. I have to join up with someone, she thought. She had information from the time she acted alongside Pukin's group. Pukin's group infiltrated the city in order to capture an assassin. Other than Pukin's group, there was also an investigation team, and they were out to chase the assassin. The assassin's ally was the fairy Toko. Wedding guessed that her own group must have been used by Toko. Was the assassin hiding among her friends, or was the assassin somewhere else entirely? Pukin's group had concluded that it wasn't funny trick. Then there's another one. Captain Grace has died. What emballed her fist? Even her nails dug into her palms. She didn't care as she put more strength into her fist. She may be infamous as a, as a school problem child, but her mind was carefree. Even when she became a magical girl, she's fought many times. She argued with Wedden, even when the majority had voted against her as leader. Wedden thought Grace was unpleasant. Perhaps Grace also didn't feel comfortable with Wedden. Yet, when she thought about Grace, she felt regret. Grace was the strongest magical girl among her friends. After all, she was muscle-brained, and while she constantly made fun of Wedden by saying she wasn't a leader, she wasn't a leader's tool. In the end, Wedden thought that she always counted on Grace. Even when she was being chased by rabbit ears, the ones that rescued Wedden and Tepsikeme, who kept on running, was Captain Grace. That's right. Rabbit ears, the ninja too. Didn't Pukin say those two were part of the official investigation team? They were a different side from Pukin's team. There was also Ma Pom. She, er, she rescued the badly beaten rabbit ears. That magical girl was definitely her ally. When the ninja sewed Wedden with her kunai so that she couldn't move, what er, Wedden could read that she had no intent on killing her. Even when rabbit ears tied her up as well, she didn't fear for her life. Pukin's group was different. They'd kill others for their own benefit, and people who would laugh as if it were fun to kill others had a different kind of power. Wedden's group, er, Wedden's group should be able to cooperate with the former. She didn't just have to meet with her friends. Perhaps there may be or there may even be other investigation team members other than Ma Pom, Rabbit Ears, or the Ninja. Maybe I can cooperate with... As she was thinking those things and running, at the same time, or at the same time, she was nearly ran over by a car. Surprised, she ran back into the alleyways. She let out a sigh when she raised her head. Her eyes met with her. A magical girl who was wearing a stage magician's costume. She seemed to have been following Wedden this whole time. The car that almost ran her over. I'm almost wondering if that was Pookin escaping. Um, she seemed to have been following Wedden this whole time. And when Wedden suddenly turned around, their eyes must have met. Funny Trick. Without thinking, she phrased it as a question, and Funny Trick tried to escape by turning around. Wedden hurriedly yelled out to stop her. Funny Trick, wait a minute. Funny Trick instantly stopped in place. Her knees were trembling. Could it be that she wanted to escape, but she can't escape? Oh, because she's her leader and she has to follow what she says. She can't escape. Wedda knew that her magical skill of unbreakable promises was still in effect because they had to listen to their leader in an emergency. Funny Trick's legs were now bound. I was being controlled by Pukin's magical skill. Whether she died or used her magic on someone else, I don't know. However, I'm not under her control right now, so please don't worry. Also, um, none of this was my intention, and I know that I'm just making excuses for myself, but I'm sorry for not rescuing you earlier. She lowered her head. Ten seconds. Looking at the chameleon plants growing in the cracks of the concrete, then raised her head. Funny Trick was still looking at her. Her knees were no longer trembling. I'm sorry for being so sudden, but I have to ask you a question. Please answer honestly. Are you the assassin that Pukin's group is after? She moved her head, shook it left and right. Since she'd order her, ordered her to be honest, then she really wasn't the assassin. Funny Trick looked back. Wedden breathed out a sigh. Tears continued to flow from both of Funny Trick's eyes, falling from her face down to her chin. Funny Trick slowly, Funny Trick slowly approached Funny Trick. 
one step after the other. I guess slowly approached Wedden, one step after the other. Opening both of her arms and hugged her, she weeped softly into Wedden's ears. Wedden also began to cry. The two of them hugged each other while continuing to cry. It's not going to end like this. I won't let it end like this. Wedden's words were also a declaration that she had made to herself. Alright, and now back to Rainbow at 10 hours 7 minutes. Let me get some water since it's a scene break. This is good so far. I'm happy that those two met back up, and I hope that they can meet up with um, Nozomi and Mei soon. Alright, so back to Rainbow. She didn't know exactly how to continue from this point. That wasn't good. The rainbows that she had made from the front and back had been dodged by a jump, and the ninja kicked the rainbow she made from below, deflecting the rainbow from above with her sword. In the meantime, Rainbow was also deflecting the flying kunai and shuriken with her rainbows. Countless rainbows and shurikens filled the sky, clashing against each other while keeping their distance. They continued their barrage, both not approaching the other. When they were attacked at the apartment, she, or she fought this ninja once. With Posteri being dead weight, they ran above Rainbow's rainbows to escape. At that time, no matter how many times she kicked away the flying kunai, their power and speed were remarkably different. At that time, Ripple believed that Rainpo was only an innocent middle schooler deceived by Toko, but now Ripple believed that Rainpo was a dangerous criminal. The ninja had no feelings of disgrace when she threw the shuriken, so that's her full power, thought Rainpo as she recognized her naivety and got angry. Her opponent was, her opponent was a cripple, her left arm and left eye were gone. Rather than looking like a winner, she looked more like she had barely survived. The kunai that flew here were dropped by the rainbows. Her rainbows weren't chipped, its strength was absolute. However, it, its stability was proportional to the size of the rainbow. If it was a small rainbow, it could be shaken off by just being hit by a kunai. However, if she used a larger rainbow for defense, her visibility would be blocked. She had to use multiple thin rainbows because Ripple's kunai flew at a bizarre trajectory. Just placing a shield won't help. She had to constantly create multiple rainbows and she had to continuously move. The two of them ran to the center of Ma Pom's opened hole, shooting a rainbow, throwing a kunai, none of them stopping, both of them breathing hard. Magical girl weapons are things that can be used without restriction. No matter how many times you shoot, arrows will continue to pop out of your quiver. No matter no matter how many times you eat, sunflower seeds will con will continue to be refreshed endlessly. No matter how many times you throw, your kunai will never run out. Ripple's kunai and shuriken were those kinds of items. No matter how many times she threw them, there was no indication that she'd run out. The shuriken and kunai changed their trajectory infinitely, leaving no other way to stop them other than brute force. Since she couldn't suddenly make complete rainbows instantly, she had to stretch them out first, whether for attack or defense, that, that created a time lag. The trajectory was also linear, as much as she could bend them, so she couldn't make sharp curves or make them have right angles, therefore their movements were easy to read. It emitted no heat or sound, and it was these, these absence of signs that was a rainbow strength. For an assassin, there's no better weapon, but it became difficult to make use of in, uh, in a direct fight. Okay, so now we're learning the, uh, the weaknesses here. She was great. And the weaknesses are basically that you can't turn them very well, which is sort of a big weakness. It definitely makes her power more fair and less OP. She was gradually being, like, imagine how OP it could be if she could make right angles with them, then she'd basically be unstoppable. Um, she was gradually being cornered. Ripple's movements were getting more intense. She had an idea that Ripple's left side should be a blind spot, but when she attacked her from that side, she avoided it all the same. Breaking her ideas, her blind spot was completely covered by her agility, and she sees things at a superhuman pace. She had no left arm either, yet the means to guard herself were the same whether she had one less arm or more. She followed up by throwing shuriken, she waited for when the rainbows aimed at her left side, delaying their initial movements by throwing a shuriken. She's had that handicap for years, and following that premise, she's found a way to fight using it. The roads were filling up with shuriken and kunai. At this rate, she'll be defeated. Her number of rainbows was also limited, but the capacity for her to control them was... er, control them all was limited. Okay. 
She had to put her focus on defensive surfaces against Ripple's shuriken, leaving her no choice but to attack rather softly. Then, the more shuriken kept flying off, continuing this vicious cycle. She couldn't escape either. She had no problem throwing away her stubbornness and pride, but she didn't want to be chased in a narrow place like residential areas and urban cityscapes. The best place to use her rainbows were wide open spaces. It'd be best to fight here rather than to be chased by homing shuriken in a tightly spaced area. Toko moved around and Rainbow gently pushed her down inside her clothes. Okay, it's fine. There was still a way. If Ripple was a heroic magical girl, then there was still a hand that Rainbow could play. Even if the ambulances or police came, it'd be fine. Even if bystanders saw them, it'll be fine. If any ordinary person sees this, then they'll also get involved. She'd be able to attack them. Ripple's movements would then collapse. She could drop them down, or she could drop them down a hole. Ripple would drop down that hole herself in order to save an innocent civilian, and then it was up to Rainbow to take advantage of that opening to either attack or escape. Toku was still moving around. Rainbow, this is weird. It's been so long, and I don't see any ambulance or police. Since she was fighting, she figured her sense of time had been confused. In fact, it was true that some time had indeed passed. Someone will come soon, she had thought. Surely some time has passed, hasn't it? Rainbow had just noticed. Pithy Frederica's escaped. That woman wasn't important. She didn't even seem intent on using her magical skill. She was no ally of Ripple either. Despite leaving her alone, would she simply escape and consider it over? It takes a coward to know one. If, an, if any ordinary person came, Ripple would be stopped. If someone had thought of that, then thought of that and mess with them so that no police, ambulance, or ordinary citizen came to them, a coward who would calmly kill other people in order to mess with them, she'd probably do that in order to stop her. Rimpo noticed her blunder. She should have taken care of Frederica quickly. Unlike Ripple, she had no way of dealing with multiple rainbows from all directions at once. She should have taken her out quickly, then focused all of her mind to fighting Ripple. She was too proud. Sonia had died, she'd killed ba She'd killed Malpom, Pukin had serious injuries, and Rainbow was drunk with thinking she was the strongest. She had judged Ripple lightly, believing that her ability to fight was the same as when they fought back at the apartment. Now she knew. Ripple was better than Rainbow. She was an opponent that had to be dealt with just as strictly as Sonya or Malpom. Ripple flew in the air. Wait, no. It was a kunai. The kunai's orbit changed like a boomerang, thrown in a trajectory that would lead it back to herself. She jumped atop the returning kunai and avoided the rainbows. What kind of training did she have to be able to do that? Toko had told Rainbow that she would become her ideal magical girl, but she's never told Rainbow that she became the ideal magical girl yet. Mean meaning, something was still missing. Rainbow created a, sh or created a rainbow shield, but the shuriken had a V-shaped orbit and avoided the shield. Rainbow immediately m er, made a rainbow in her opposite palm and struck it down. While doing that, she didn't stop and continued to run above the rainbow. Suddenly, on the edge of her sight, she could see something moving from the ground as she ran, er, moving from the ground, seeing it as she ran. It was posteri. She wasn't trying to escape, running from the shuriken and rainbow above her head, crawling around the hole like a caterpillar. Against the other middle schoolers, she could use her as a hostage. But against Ripple, she wouldn't work as a hostage, so Rainbow left her alone. What was Postery doing then? Postery was crying, and her wailing voice rose. While she was crawling, she held many kunai and shuriken in her hands. Ripple saw her as well, turning around and looking at her strangely. At that moment, see, I figured something like this would happen. That Postery, even though Rainbow is evil, she still sees Rainbow as her friend and wants to try to save her or just in general just still sees her as a friend and thinks she must have a reason for doing this and she's going to help her still. Uh, Postery was crying and her wailing voice rose. While she was crawling she held many kunai and shuriken in her hands. Ripple saw her as well, turning around and looking at her strangely. At that moment all the shuriken and kunai that Postery held in her hands grew wings. Ripple has seen this magical skill several times. She realized what Postery was trying to do. Ripple threw three shuriken and five kunai at the same time, but with that throw that lacked strength, Rainbow was able to flick them all away with rainbows so it didn't reach Postery. The winged kunai and shuriken aimed for their owner, and all flew at once. Ripple had a ninja blade in her mouth. 
grabbed a shuriken in her right arm and threw it, even tried to intercept them with her wooden geta shoes, but the amount of shuriken and kunai being sent back was enormous. The winged shuriken and kunai passed her interception net and pierced the ninja's cheeks, chin, shoulders, and chest one after the other. When one pierced her throat, Ripple's body staggered greatly. Now that she couldn't intercept or dodge, her entire body had been stabbed. Eventually, she detransformed, returning to a figure of a girl wearing a coat, and fell down into the hole. Okay. So now we're jumping to Nanako-san, getting away from this fight in general. Oh. My shit. Well, Ripple's definitely... Look, I don't think Ripple died from that. I feel like Ripple is a main character enough that she is fine for now. Especially since she fell into the hole where uh, she can climb back up or somebody can find her and she can be better later on. But I do think she's down for now. I think Posteri and Rainbow are going to escape. But uh, now we have Nanako-san with remaining time, 9 hours and 45 minutes. Let's see where the next uh, scene break is before I continue. I am going to continue though. I'm going to do this next section. Next one is at the end of page 17, start of page 18. Um... And the next one after that's on page 19. I might go all the way until page 19. I'll see. I'll read at least the next section, and then maybe the section after that, but we'll see. So we're jumping out of Nanako-san with 9 hours and 45 minutes remaining. Mana restart. I, I guess I kind of want to cut it. Well, I'm not going to cut it short, but I'm going to end it after a section or two. Even though the battery's doing okay right this second, I feel like I'm losing my voice really, really badly. Um, Nanako-san, 9 hours, 45 minutes remaining. Mana restarted the healing ritual again. It didn't succeed. Hana's hand that Nanako-san kept holding gradually cooled down. She grasped it, shook it, and even called out to her. Hana's body temperature didn't come back. Since there were no hints, she used her goggles. But seeing all the number, Honestly, though, this death kind of made me think Hana was kind of lame. Like, I didn't really like this death very much, because Pukin was injured as all hell, and still just completely demolishes Hana. So, um, I don't know. Kind of made me think, ah, oh, Hana was so cool. And her power was so OP that it always made me wonder, why didn't she just, like, immediately make everybody super hearing or visually powerful that sensory over overload they completely collapsed she did that before but I don't understand why she didn't just do that every single time I mean it would have gotten repetitive but it would have been logical so either way I don't know I guess I just don't get it um, Hana's hand that Nanako-san kept holding yeah we got all that um, but seeing all the numbers fall down it became unbearable and she turned it off Hana's wounds were deep her blood flowed and as they were wounds that a magical girl couldn't handle. She reverted back to human form and silently died. Nanako-san shedded tears while holding on to Hana's arms. Hana had been wounded, yet she still stood up. She did her best to, re to resist after seeing that Nanako-san and Mana couldn't escape, and concentrated all of her attacks onto her all the all of her enemies' attacks onto herself. If Hana weren't here, Nanako-san and Mana would have been killed as well. Her boss's instructions backfired. She chose a place where Hana could be healed safely, but who could have predicted that Pukin would coincidentally find them there? It was too horrible. Also, Pukin was just trying to escape. They could have all just ran away too. It seemed like such a pointless death. They could have all just ran away, and Pukin probably wouldn't have chased them down trying to kill them. She was injured too and was just trying to get out of there. It was a complete coincidence, like they just said. So, yeah. I just, I don't really get why she died in this way or why she even tried to fight Pukin here when hell they even could have teamed up to go back and take on Rainbow so yeah I don't know Hana died a really dumb death I guess um but either way wounded couldn't escape her boss's instructions backfired she chose a place where Hana could be healed safely but who could have predicted that Pukin would coincidentally find them there it was too horrible. Hana's sleeping face was peaceful. Her age was about in her late teens. Even when she transformed into a magical girl, she was calm. As opposed to the emotional mana, she extended her cooperation to Ripple and Nanako-san. Okay. Who were intruding 
external officers, and from there they became, they became the investigation team. Nanako-san wiped her tears with her sleeves. She was in no... <clears throat> I, I need some water. I don't know what's up with my voice. She was in no acceptable position to just be crying. Mana was even more sad than Nanako-san, who had just met Hana yesterday. She could see that Mana was crying just because she couldn't contact Hana as she shouted emotionally. She had to follow up. She had to comfort Mana. Even if it was just a little bit, and even if she would get the worst beating ever, she attentively looked at Mana, and Mana was in her underwear. She looked healthy and cute in her small ribbons and long pink camisole, and the strangeness of a girl who undressed in a back alley made her stand out. She wanted to ask what she was doing, but she stopped her extended hand halfway. Mana's face was serious. It wasn't sullen. She wasn't angry, and she wasn't sad either. It was the expression of someone who was serious about doing something from now. Mana removed her magical school uniform and black coat and put it and black coat from her magical bag and silently buttoned it up. She fastened the hooks, wore the large pointed wizard hat, and finally took out a twisted cane. Nanako-san watched silently until she finished changing. She was fascinated. Despite it being normal for a mage to use a mage's clothes, it really fit perfectly. She thought it didn't look like a battle or she thought it looked like a battle uniform of some kind, but when she wondered what kind of battle she was going into, her voice began to tremble. Uh, um, Mana, where are you killing them? There's no need to ask wh who she wants to kill. Nanako-san spread her arms out wide and stood in front of Mana. Didn't you see her skill? Even if I helped you out, we'd both be killed. Move. Her eyes were steady. She was no longer the group leader who had made the official judgment not to kill the criminals. She was the only girl left who could avenge her friends. Mana pointed her cane toward Nanako-san. Nanako-san staggered backwards, intimidated. Mana muttered something with her mouth, combining with her left hand that was waving a sigil of some sort. Was she trying to eliminate anyone who would stand in her way? Nanako-san trembled as she placed her hand on top of the tip of the cane and gently moved her foot. It wasn't just her hand, but her voice was trembling too, yet she couldn't speak. Why do you think Hana did it? Why do you think she volunteered for this job? Mana, who was more stubborn, more stubborn than a rock and didn't want to listen, breathed out. Because of that, her spell was interrupted, and Nanako-san also breathed a sigh of relief. Why do you even know something like that? When you went to the convenience store to buy food, Hana told me. It was a lie. Hana never told her anything like that. Everything she did was according to her goggles instructions, information that she received from her boss. Hana wasn't originally in charge of this operation. She knew that Mana, who, had only, who only had experience in leading three investigations, was put in charge and applied. Hana's magical girl test administrator was Mana's father, and after she became an official magical girl, she was adopted into their family ever since. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what's up. I just cannot speak at all. My throat is so dry. The one that Hana gave her magical girl name, Hanageko Kujo, was also Mana's father. He was her godfather. Somehow that scene came into her eyes. Were they like sisters? An older sister who came to rescue the, her inexperienced younger sister despite her depressed mood. Inside of all that was a bright younger sister. Nanako-san could even understand how Mana's father saw Hana. Sorry, I'm just trying to finish this section. Who he had given a name that was similar to his daughter Mana. Even if you wanted to kill her, she'd just turn the tables around. You can't win. So I won't win. What's your point? If you don't win, then you'll die a meaningless death. Hana's sacrifice will be meaningless. Hana was trying to protect you, Mana. Isn't that why she volunteered for this? Mana opened her mouth. She wanted to say something, but she closed it again without saying anything. Mana gripped her wizard's hat and threw it on the ground. Her shoulder trembled as she hung her head. Mana had Hana on her mind, yet she still had to be persuaded. Nanako-san didn't want Mana to die. Hana kept... Hana tried to keep Mana alive. At the very least, she didn't want that effort to go to waste. Nanako-san tried to say something further, but was stopped when she saw the words on her instructions. Mapam has died. She felt a shock from her head to her foot as if a hammer had struck her. Somehow she was able to keep her feet standing. Foreign Affairs Division has confirmed it from the recorder they had installed on her body. 
Some in the division have already begun to move, wondering if this case could be treated as a first-class magic crime. Rumors say they plan to unleash a large-scale weapon of mass destruction the same time they break the barrier. A WMD. If they use that, not only magical girls in the city, but they'd be indiscriminately killing the civilians as well. Was that thing even allowed? The Foreign Affairs Division was counting on Malpom, and her death seemed to have made them go berserk. They can be quite desperate and unreasonable. I'd like you to solve this case before the barrier's broken. If you manage to suppress the assassin and escape, er, and the escaped prisoners, then the Foreign Affairs Division will not act. If you don't have enough fighting power, then... Fighting power, that's right, Ripple. She went to rescue Malpom. If Malpom had been killed, then what happened to Ripple? If Ripple was in danger, then Nanako-san wanted to save her. But how much help could Nanako-san and Mana be? Her mind kept spinning. What should I do? She has no idea what to think, yet she was obedient to the instructions given to her by her goggles. We can't win on our own. Even if we can capture the assassins, we can't beat Frederica's group. The middle school students that Toko had tricked. Kurukuru Hime's group. We should offer our cooperation. Okay, this was really, really good. Sorry I haven't been able to appreciate it as much as I should have. Holy crap, I feel really sick right now. I, I can't, like, my vo my throat is so dry, I can't even talk right. So, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. I don't know what's happened, but, yeah, I really don't feel good right now. So, um, either way, I'll read the rest of Chapter 10 later. I liked this. Uh, Hana did have a really dumb death that seemed really unnecessary. Like, she could have just ran away, or offered to team up with Pukin, or just not done anything, just stood there and let Pukin run past to escape. I mean, I really don't understand the point of this death. Um, it was very illogical. Uh, so the Ripple fight was really cool. We learned more about Rainbow, and there was something else that I wanted to talk about. Oh uh, yeah, the, uh, the relationship between Mana and Hana being explained is good. But either way, I'm going to end this here, so like if you like the video, comment down there, tell me what you thought of it and my first thoughts and reaction. Subscribe for more, follow on Twitter if you want, I can try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel. If you want a link to our Discord server, just, um, oh god, um, just ask and I'll give you a link. That's it, thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.